Hi there, my name is Kevin Alcuni and I'm a librarian in the Exploration and Creativity Department here with the Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made Your Author program, Seen and Unseen, what three photographers reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. Before we begin, we'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, as well as our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, along with our behind the scenes staff for helping bring this LA Made and Your Author program to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. While our amazing Your Author series looks to connect authors and illustrators with patrons and library staff throughout our 72 branches. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. And for our Your Author programs, please visit lapl.org slash Your Author. We'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honor their elders past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, check out native-land.ca. And now for today's program, Seen and Unseen, what three photographers reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. The Los Angeles Public Library in collaboration with the Japanese American National Museum is proud to present authors Elizabeth Partridge, Lauren Tamaki, as they discuss their latest works of nonfiction, Seen and Unseen, what Dorothea Lang, Toyo Miyataki, and Ansel Adams photographs reveal about the Japanese American incarceration. Moderating this program will be Dr. Kristen Hayashi, Director of Collections, Access, and Management at Janum. Seen and Unseen features powerful images of the Japanese American incarceration captured by three photographers, Dorothea Lang, Toyo Miyataki, and Ansel Adams, along with firsthand accounts of this grave moment in history. Those watching this pro virtual program will have an opportunity to win a free book, so email ecdepartment at lapl.org to be entered into the opportunity drawing. And now let's welcome our guests in, Elizabeth, Lauren, and Kristen. Hi, y'all. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So I understand there's a uh, short uh, slideshow uh, to be presented. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, after that, Kristen will come back on and uh, we'll start a conversation. Thank you so much. Sounds fantastic. So um, I'm Elizabeth Partridge. I was the author of this book and um, Lauren and I put together a slideshow of a, a little bit about uh, how we put together the book and how we kind of worked back and forth to get the whole thing to come together. So I started this off by taking it to my editor at Chronicle, Ariel Richardson, and got going with, first of all, slides, um, first of all, with photographs from Dorothea Lang. Next slide, please. This is a quote Dorothea said after photographing the incarceration. This is what we did. How did it happen? How could we? Those are like such major questions that have to be thought about when you read this book. It's just vital to what we are trying to do. Next. So that little girl in the rickrack is me, and that is Dorothea Lang. Uh, that's the two of us together. We celebrated all our holidays together. We lived right across um, town from her, and my father had been her um, assistant and then sort of became part son, so we got melted into her whole family. And so I grew up around her a lot and understanding her politics and being very influenced by them. Next. This is a photograph that actually I have a huge copy of this photograph on the wall of my studio that I walk into every day. Um, when Dorothea was putting together her final show at MoMA, this my dad ended up with this photograph. It was not one of the ones used in her exhibition, but it was must have been a reject, but it's a lovely photograph. Uh, the title is Grandfather and Grandson. Um, I have always felt that the grand, uh, the, the, this always makes me a little emotional. The grandfather has kind of been asking me for a long time, when will you tell our story? So it became time to tell their story. Next. 
This is a photograph of Dorothea Langs you may well recognize. Um, she photographed extensively from the beginning before people were incarcerated all the way following them into Manzanar because she felt it was very important to show life before everything changed. The government hired her, but she was actually very against the incarceration. And she did her photographs to show uh, what a suspension of civil liberties this was. Next. One of her big problems, it says underneath, negative impounded by Beasley. Beasley was um, a major in the army and he impounded a number of her photographs. Not all of them, but they were very, the military was very careful what they wanted to show of her photographs. So next slide, please. This is her friend Ansel Adams. I knew he had also photographed the incarceration because uh, Dorothy always said about him, he, he still doesn't get it. Although they were good friends, they had a very different view of what the incarceration had been about. Next slide. As I, uh, oh, that's a great example of the kinds of photographs Ansel took. He wanted to show that everybody was having that these were citizens who deserve to come back and be respected after being at Manzanar. He came in at the end of the war, whereas Dorothea had photographed more at the beginning. As I began researching, I also found Toyo Miyataki. Next. It's a beautiful photograph of Toyo that was actually taken by Ansel. Um, Toyo was incarcerated. He was a professional photographer living in Los Angeles. And he came in to Manzanar smuggling in a lens and a um, negative holder. And then his friends built him a wooden camera box and he took photographs. Next, he was able to photograph things that Dorothea had been forbidden to photograph, like the way the toilets were just lined up next to each other in the bathroom. Next. He also photographed things that no outsider would have ever seen. There was a place under the fence that the Japanese Americans could escape out from Manzanar and then get back under without the guards seeing them. And they used to go up into the Sierras and go trout fishing. Next. So what I did when I had everything in my mind, all the photographs and the text that would go with it, I have a big wall in my room where I work and I put up a bunch of photographs and a bunch of text because I needed to get an overview of what I was looking at. Next. This is a photograph by Ansel. Um, it looks like this family is living in a cute little cottage outside where there's lots of fields around them. And I was very careful to include this photograph because it was extremely representative of the way Ansel photographed. Next, when I put it, when I sent it to the editor who would choose Lauren Tamaki as our illustrator, I drew out really roughly a picture of what actually was Ansel had taken out of the image, which was that he had cropped out the fact that this was the end um, apartment in one of the big barracks. So then all this material that I got together was turned over to Lauren Tamaki, and she took it from there. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, when our editor, Ariel Richardson, and Betsy came to my agent, Charlotte Sheedy, I, I was... Of course I was interested, but I was so intimidated. But Betsy's previous image of her, you know, quick drawing to extend the building, this this kind of seed of an idea let me know that my illustrations could add to this topic. My illustrations could fill in some of the gaps on this topic. And it gave me the freedom to imagine different scenarios how the illustrations could live with with the with the, the photography. <laughs> and and it was such a perfect illustration of how we remember an event based on how we document it. And um, so this is the finished image um, that we're starting with just to show how the author, the quick author sketch goes to the final, final ink. Um, next. 
Uh, and so the first thing I, because of course I was so intimidated, I had no reference point. <laughs> it wasn't really taught too much in school. Uh, where I'm from in Canada, uh, same thing happened, yet it's still something that wasn't really discussed. Uh, so I had to start from scratch and just read books about the history of the time, read books about Dorothea Lange. Impounded was such a great uh, ref uh, reference point for me. Uh, Betsy sent me books, you know, like my, my uh, agent gave me books and it was a long process. I, I did a ton of obviously imagery from the internet, um, but also got out every book from the library that I could. And uh, the Densho Digital Repository, which aggregates all of these personal photos from Japanese Americans was a huge resource for me too. Um, I just was grappling with the enormity of this topic and the situation. Uh, next. And you know, just it's it's funny how this mirrors Betsy's uh, uh, kind of overview uh, because it's what I really needed to do as well. You know, her photo choices, my kind of proposed photo choices, because it was such a permeable uh, experience. And I, I know I'm spoiled for the rest of my life from from this experience with with this author and this editor because I was I said, well, why don't we add this photo? Well, why don't we add this? You know, I think we're ha you know some connective tissue needs to be added. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But this is what a very huge part of, of starting it was just getting it all laid out in front of me. And it's a mess. And I was I was a mess. <laughs> so it's indicative of that time. So next. And but it's great to have images on a screen and on your computer, but I had to print them out and put them into books and, and kind of group things that way. Uh, it was it was important just for me to have something physically in my hands. So all of uh, not all of the uh, reference imagery, but a, a bunch of it, I printed out, put into a book, and then the next the one beside it is my sketches uh, for pretty much the entire book. Next, so just an example of that. I'm like, oh, you know, some interesting clothes, some interesting poses, um, some interesting faces. You, you know, because it was really about highlighting how different and unique everybody was and how different everybody's experience was it, to say, no, this isn't a monolith. Asian Americans are not a monolith. Japanese Americans are not a monolith. Everybody was different. So obviously I had to really press that and, and, and push that. Uh, next. And just an example of sketches and how I would take Betsy's kind of photo text and put it on one side of the page and be like, well, how am I gonna work this? How am I going to, add to this because the photos are so beautiful and they're so evocative and, and so powerful on their own. And so everything just had to play well together. And this is just an example of one of my sketch pages. Next. And uh, I did it all in ink. It's all acrylic ink, which is this stuff, FW. Uh, and par partly because that's the way I work. I work completely analog and I scan stuff in and I put it, you know, put into Photoshop, clean it up, maybe add like a color. Uh, a few of these do have a color flood over them in the, in the finished book. And, um, and I thought it was appropriate for the period, which the 1940s um, and all that research came in handy as shorthand just for the clothing um, to make it feel real. And once I had done that like year and a half of research, I could really just dig into this and, and go to the races. Next. Um, yeah, as you can see here, so this is at Tan Foran, um, everybody looking for their luggage, like in this piles of luggage and just wanting each person to have their moment and, and to be called out and putting Dorothea in the mix of all of it. She's on the top left. Next. Uh, I wanted to uh, take the photos that Betsy had put up in the beginning of this uh, presentation and show how they were integrated with the photography, with the illustration, with everything. Um, obviously, this super powerful image of Japanese American store owner being like, I am an American, contrasted with some of the super hateful propaganda that was everywhere. Uh, imagery, even children's cartoonists <laughs> would add to this dialogue. And of course, I, I wanted that personal moment. I wanted it to be pretty confrontational. And I just thought, what, what would I feel like if I had passed a sign like that or uh, a hateful sign saying I wasn't allowed somewhere and I would try and keep it inside until I couldn't. And so that's, that's why I use that, like my own personal emotions in there. 
and as well as obviously reading about it and reading about people and you know we tried to keep a stiff upper lip and and so again research comes in handy next and then our impounded page and it, it was you know important to show that yes maybe it, there was some dialogue of how how many were impounded oh you know we can't overstate it but but the truth was there were there were dozens and uh just wanted to show that interaction that dorothea had with with beasley with general beasley and and how frustrated she must have been because she was there to represent what she saw and she she saw a rounded experience and they they didn't want that and i just to highlight also the absurdity of why was this image impounded and not this one it's just so subjective up to this up to this guy <laughs> next and then Toyo's photos, I just wanted to highlight how he worked in secret. He could only photograph at dawn and, and, that, and that determination and to, to show the truth. And, and Betsy just outlines it perfect. Everybody's motivations uh, in this book is, is really clear. Next. And then Ansel's photo. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I don't, it wasn't done with malice. He he was definitely like representing, he, he took a photo, people, you know, played games, people had genuine experiences, um, but it's just a matter of context. Right outside that volleyball game were barbed wire fences and guards with guns. And so, and, and, and he could take photos from the top of uh, guard towers and <laughs> Toyo couldn't. And so it's a matter of perspective. And again, perspective, so important in this book. Uh, next. And uh, just to close this out, thinking about just thing, the parts of the book that were just illustrations, that connective tissue, uh, things that couldn't be photographed, things that, that weren't photographed, uh, this bus ride from LA to Tanferan um, with all of the, the sh you know, boarded up windows, nobody knew where they were going, just to kind of, again, get the insight of what could a six-year-old think when she's being transported on a bus with all the windows blacked out, you know, where are we going? Who, why are we, who was taking us there? Just the confusion and the, and the, the kind of scary moment. Um, and also the riot was a huge part of, yeah. of filling in that gap that wasn't actually photographed. And uh, next. And Betsy, I don't know if you wanted to talk a bit about the back matter a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, we, I really got into the back matter, I have to say, oh, yeah. because there's so much to unpack in a book like this. There's, you know, first we did after the war, what happens to people? That was a really important page turn for us. But then we got into some of the more difficult questions about what kinds of words would we use, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And what are your rights as a citizen and what how did they get violated? You know, that's just amazing uh, that we could actually do that. So what what allows us to do that? And then Lauren just had this fantastic idea about wanting to address the damage of the model minority myth. And it was like, take a spread, go for it. So go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, it was it was incredible because I, you know, I've written in the past, but this book, the way it changed me as like an artist and a writer, um, it's I couldn't I couldn't be more thankful to have the opportunity to put into words because I, it's something that I experienced growing up. It's something I still experience the model minority myth, and you know I have to give credit to my sister who's like remember you know something to remember when when you're doing this book and um, yeah it and I know we're going to talk about it later with uh, Kristen. So, but just the back matter in this book, it, it keeps on getting mentioned in, you know, when people are reviewing it because it is such a great tool for in the classroom and, and, to, and to start to think more deeply about these concepts. And, and yeah, I, I, I can't wait to talk to Kristen about this. I feel like we're, <laughs> there's so much to talk about and she has such great questions. So, so uh, yeah. next, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Lauren, for that great introduction. I was kind of scrambling, taking notes, because you addressed so many of the questions that I had from that presentation. So hopefully we can get into some of those topics a little bit more deeply. Um, but maybe we'll just start with the title of the book, Seen and Unseen. Um, you know, Elizabeth, you started with Dorothea Lang's photographs. That was the connection that you had. 
you could have just written a book about Dorothea Lange's photographs, right? But she included these other two photographers, and I think for a very good reason. So I'm wondering if maybe you can sort of um, describe like why you chose to include the three photographers, Lang, Miyatake, and Adams, um, and and maybe like you know how does how is their photography different? Like what different perspectives do they share, um, and how does that help to tell you know a broader um, narrative about the incarceration? Maybe we'll start with that. Yeah. Okay. So the titles to start there. It, that was actually a pain. It, we, we kept tossing out ideas and they just kept not quite working. We wanted to have the photographer's names in there. So we kind of had a pretty good idea what our subtitle would be. But coming up with a title was tricky. Um, we came up with one or two that um, got vetoed. And then eventually we realized, oh, seen and unseen is a great uh, metaphor for what what each photographer saw and what they didn't see. And then what we see as viewers and what is unseen to us. So that was what we eventually alighted on. It is a long title, but we felt like every bit of it was super important. So that's how we came up with, you know, tossing it around. This was, Lauren alluded to this a little bit. This was an unusual project. Usually when you do a children's or young adult book, the person who's doing the illustration when the, when the author is done writing the text, it goes to the illustrator. And the two of us are usually kept apart. But that was not our process. Our process was back and forth, back and forth. It was so fun because we were able, like, Lauren would say, oh, how about this photograph? That would kind of go well if I sketched like this. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's sub that out. Or hey, how about this one? Oh, yeah, let's do that. And so we were up in each other's business a whole lot. <laughs> also, yeah. we had photographs. I had already sort of like broken the, what do they call that, the fourth wall already by having that foot in the door there. And so, the, and then Lauren would like come in and um, do all kinds of things that worked for her. And it just, we ended up with a much stronger book because of the collaboration. Did you want to say something about that, Lauren? Oh, no. I mean, you nailed it. It, it was just the the back and forth and, and just the ping pong. It was incredible. And and your idea for the three photographers, um, just to go back to the question a little bit, it was it was it was central to this book, it, it, right? The the idea of these different ways that it was interpreted by these different photographers. Uh, you know, a, a white woman, a Japanese man, and a white man. You know, they come from different backgrounds. They had different intentions, and you outlined it so beautifully what the intentions were, and 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 I I would take everything that I saw in the text, and I was like, okay, well, I want title pages for each of these you know, sections, because we need to highlight that. We need to say, you know, you're switching your lens, you're switching your view now to this, to what this person is, is seeing. Um, and it's just, just a, a fantastic concept for, for a book. It's <laughs> true. And the title is brilliant on so many levels. You know, I think it has so many different meanings. Um, and you, you just kind of touched upon this. You mentioned that, you know, with the, a photograph, the photographer is really orchestrating what is framed in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that more. You, you started to allude to that when you mentioned that they're coming yeah. from two different backgrounds. So, sorry. No, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that yeah, a little just, more? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think books get really interesting when they get complex. And by having the three photographers, it just made this lovely complexity where you have to stop and really think about how you are t looking at things when you look at, a, at an image. Here's a great example. There's a, this is a good example that Lauren was just holding up like how she like broke up the sections and she was like, okay, now we're switching to Dorothea Lang. Now we're gonna switch and see, there's Toyo. Um, because Dorothea wanted to show how incredibly unjust the incarceration was. Toyo, he actually had a very complex job to do. 
he did photograph what was not, he was not allowed, what others were not allowed to photograph by sneaking around. But then he also needed to bear witness to the camp for the people who were there. They needed to document children's birthdays, weddings, classes. They had to survive in these circumstances. So it's always very interesting when an insider shows things that are going well in an inside situation, they can be criticized for that. But it's very important, the work he was doing inside for the people inside. And then Ansel comes in, he's a big guy, noisy guy, and he's like photographing. And people are like, well, let's be on our best behavior with this guy. And so they were. I mean, it was really very clear that it was a whole different vibe. So I just, I love that. I, I absolutely love that texture of the three photographers. It was when I found Toyo, I was like, okay, <laughs> now we got a book. Well, actually that's not true. That was one more big discovery. We've got Lauren to illustrate. <laughs> now we have a book, oh my gosh. So, and that was the editor's job to find the illustrator. So it was like, okay, this book started as about I forget what it was, like 60 pages. And then Lauren gets in there and starts opening it up and just putting stuff in there. And we ended up at what, 120 pages. I mean, it was- Something, something like that. <laughs> yeah. anyway, there was just so, like, like Lauren mentioned, the things that nobody was able to photograph were very, very important to have as part of the whole book. Because that's an important part of- um, visual media, what is not photographed? You know, you have to think of the emptiness as opposed to the fullness. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was definitely a challenge, <laughs> you know, it, photographing a riot when I had no, and I'm such a, a, if you didn't notice already, a person who loves reference. I love reference for faces. I love reference for the way a, a shirt folds. You know, I, I take tons of reference photos of myself to like get, get some of those things. And, and, uh, and yeah, so so that was the biggest challenge was the riot because it, it you know it was still a, a children's books I and a children's book rather and I I needed to represent something so violent and so scary um, so we did a lot just uh, the sequences going from from light to shadow to to complete darkness um, just so we could communicate the the mood of it but then also be appropriate. For the age group yeah and also there were parts something that you sort of like, just touched on oh, sorry. oh go ahead oh no there, no please please go ahead okay this was something that was really as i researched i found stories that i felt i really wanted to bear witness to that i felt were very very important during the riot several young men were killed because the military police were brought in and they so-called quelled it. And one of these young men, basically he spent several days dying of a gunshot wound to his abdomen because they didn't have the medicines to take care of him. And so I wanted to honor him in this book because I had an opportunity to say, this needs to be known. And so I was able to write the text but then Lauren was able to make this just incredible drawing so that you could feel what had happened. So, thank you. I think the book is so interesting because you're incorporating historical photographs and mm -hmm. illustrations. I think there's this misconception that photography is um, the more accurate or that it's more realistic. Um, and I think by you just talking about this insider outsider relationship and how incarcerees, Japanese American incarcerees responded to Toyo differently or Dorothea differently than they would have to Ansel Adams and how that um, you know doesn't necessarily come, well, you have to, to be very observant, I think when you're looking at mm -hmm. the photographs mm -hmm. and you really make that point well. So I, I, I just, I just wonder if you could talk about mediums like photography versus illustration and, uh, and, and sort of how they work maybe together. Yeah, or... you know, I think that's really, 
I can address the photography side of it, which is like, um, you know, because I grew up in a family of photographers, I'm used to seeing people frame a photograph. You know, my dad used to go like this. He'd put up his hand mm -hmm. like this, and then then he knew what he wanted. And then up came the camera, and he took the shot. And I, so I understood intuitively that photographs were always cropped. You know that. Ansel would always make sure he stepped over the garbage before he took a beautiful picture. Whereas somebody like Dorothea is gonna leave that garbage in so that you see it in a beautiful spot. So I, I love the idea of playing with framing and how they frame things. And also just that intention, every ph photograph, there's a, an intention behind the photograph. And I think, you know, young people are, they've got this camera in their back pocket and they're used to messing with what they show, you know, and it can cause a lot of harm on social media. If people are like buying cheap clothes and putting them on and taking cute pictures of themselves and then throwing the clothes away. So I wanted to give kids something thoughtful to think about, about how photographs work. And then Lauren's images, I'll, I'll just say one thing before Lauren has a chance to say. It. Can you put up the slide of the picture of um, I am an American with Lauren's drawings on there? 23. Um, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> I don't have that up. Yes, this one. Okay. What I love, love, love about this is you take this straight up photograph that's powerful enough right there. I'm an American. Okay. Boom. You've got great straightforward imagery. But then what Lauren did with this is if you look at the woman on the first part of the page uh, close up to us, I'm so struck by this drawing because to me, if I look at her eyes, her eyes look angry and sad, but her mouth is so sad. And it's like, how did Lauren do that? There's like two emotions on this person's face. And then the next picture of her in the distance walking and the flowers petals are falling. I mean, that is not in the photographs. It can't be in the photographs, but that gives this emotional ver verity to this spread. That's just, uh, just goes right to the heart. Go ahead. Uh, Thank Lauren, you. I'm sure you'd like to say something too. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. I mean, that face was really hard. I mean, just as like, you know, insider baseball sports, uh, that face was very hard to, I, I, I drew it 10 times because it was a complex emotion that I wanted to yes. convey. Um, uh, we can take this slide down now. We can just go back. Yeah, hi. <laughs> so when it comes to, can it, does illustration tell the truth? Does, does photography tell the truth? What, what truth does it tell? I mean, I've been in a courtroom uh, drawing before, you know, because where cameras can't go. Uh, I drew the Bill Cosby trial for the New York Times and, you know, done some reportage drawing where I, I really just wanted to capture this exact moment and or a nuanced moment or or, or an interaction. Um, and that's really what the goal was for this. Obviously, I wasn't there, but, you know, Mine Akubo, her book, um, Citizen 13660, uh, you know, I was, you know, just talking at with at dinner with with a friend and, and he's like, well, have you heard of this book when he heard about my project? I'm like, no, you know, just just the, like my lack of knowledge on this. And when I picked it up, I was like, first of all, I was like, well, uh, why should I even bother? It's so good. Why should you know, I, it is so incredible, not only the drawings, but the way she she conveyed more she with with one sketch than you could with a million photos because it, it was her point of view, it was her emotions, but it was also very, you know, matter of factly ca capturing this moment. And uh, with everything, I was trying to pick out tender moments, moments of that, that people were taking care of each other. Uh, so everything I used in this book and, and Betsy Bird, this great reviewer, kind of talked about how, how do we draw nonfiction and have it be accurate and, and, research, 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 research is the answer. And um, pretty much like everybody in this lineup uh, 
is is based off a real photo because I didn't want to make it up. And and um, this one interaction of just this back, you know, this hug from behind, this moment of tenderness. It, I think, it, it just again helps humanize the the whole event. And I, I, it was so important. So, so yeah, is illustration real? Is photography real? Is anything real? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned Mineo Kubo. So Mineo Kubo was the first former incarceree to publish a book length memoir of her experience. And that was an illustrated memoir. And she published that in 1946. And Janum, the Japanese American National Museum has her collection. So we have all, we have hundreds of the quick sketches that she made in camp. We have all of the original illustrations for Citizen 13. Six six zero. Oh Mine, I'm just going to put in a little plug for Janum. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sitting. I'm, I'm on a plane Janum tomorrow to, to go see that. <laughs> that is incredible. My God. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, I'm sitting in one of Janum's galleries right now. I am intentionally sitting here because behind me you see Dorothea Lang's um, photographs. These are reproductions of photographs that are in the Library of Congress um, collection, and we have an exhibition right now that just dovetails so beautifully with seen and unseen um, that you know you can come and see. Uh, the exhibition is called Be Here 1942 and it's an augmented reality exhibition by a Japanese artist named Masaki Fujihata. He um, was really just captured by all of the, the photography that was taken of the forced removal and subsequent incarceration. And his medium is augmented reality. And so he, was, he used um, Dorothea Lange's photographs and photographs by other um, photographers to try to recreate um, what the forced removal, you know, looked like. And so you can come to the museum, you can see these photographs. Um, and then, you know, he was very interested in the photographer's perspective, just like um, Elizabeth and, and, you know, Lauren do in this book. And he wanted you to sort of imagine as, well as what it was like to be the subject of the photographs and sort of you know, be in their shoes. So I invite you to come to the museum and, and see um, these photographs. And since we've been talking about uh, artifacts, <laughs> I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit more about, about your research. You kind of pointed to it um, in your presentations, but um, yeah, talk about maybe Elizabeth, if you could talk about your research and then Lauren, if, if you could talk about like, you talked a little bit about your inspiration for the illustrations, but how long does it take you to create some of these illustrations. There's so many in the book, so. Yeah, you know, uh, I think it was actually 2015 that um, Ariel Richardson, the editor and I came up with this idea. That's how long this book take, took to come to fruition. Um, I'm an archive rat. I love nothing more than doing a lot of research. <laughs> it is so fun to me. And the most important thing for me is to go all the way down to primary sources because secondary source is interesting and it's a great place to start. But if you get all the way down to the primary, which is where somebody is telling their own story or you have photographs or documentation from the times, those primary sources are so rich. So um, I found those all over the place. Some of the funnest ones for me were um, hearing, or mostly I read um, people who had already done an oral history of someone who was in the camp. And any time I could get a firsthand um, piece of information, a, a quote about, a, about being in the camp or leaving the camp, I was very eager to do that. I also found just randomly, like um, I have a neighbor who was a young child when she was incarcerated with her family. And I told her I was beginning to work on this book. And she told me about how her, her parents had to burn, they burned everything that associated them with Japan because they were so afraid. And she was telling me about how painful that was for her mother 
and that her mother was crying the whole time she was doing it. So she was just, I think five, and it's like a burned memory into her. And so we were able to do a whole spread on that, or at least that one page of that where Lauren did this incredible photograph. Again, no photograph, <laughs> nobody had a, we didn't have a photograph of that, but um, Lauren did this great job that once again, captures that amazing emotion of what it's like. Do you know what number that is? Oh, we don't have a um, oh, slide. Let me see if I can, just, but I can flip to it. I can just show you this. Oh, it's, it's uh, Lauren took this and starting with this page that everything, sorry, you guys would have to be burned. And there it is. This, it, it's an absence of everything except the sparks flying up. So, yeah, anyway, so those kinds of research things where we just rolled on top of each other's research was amazing. And then Lauren did a ton of her own research. Yeah, I mean, I it, it like I said, or, you know, mentioned the presentation, it was completely necessary. I, I felt like I, I had to mm -hmm. do justice to not only Betsy's book, but the people that this happened to by act by educating myself on it and so so just you know um bare bones up into okay well visually how am i going to represent this and um you know going to my ink okay well you know that's like a great medium for this and then looking at um actually japanese photograph books from the 1940s which had a lot of like color floods a lot of gradients because um, uh, Toyo Miyataki was a pictorial uh, uh, photographer. And that was just such like a moment in time. And these beautiful um, photo books from Japan were just there. <laughs> you know, you dig far enough and you and you will just find so much gold. And um, and then even with and, and you know, I, I taught briefly and then everybody, oh, you know, it's homework to do research. But but it is it's where you find everything is in research and uh, and especially these primary source documents that Betsy was referring to, this idea of, well, I'm like, well, why don't we just, and, and I think this was kind of both of our thoughts, why don't we just put them in there? Why don't we just put a tag in there? Why don't we put um, the outtake form, the good luck to you <laughs> as you leave Manzanar, here's what you get, uh, don't deviate from this plan, uh, because it, it puts the, the reader, it, it puts it in their hands, right? So they can, they can they're one step closer to it and to that experience. Um, so as much of the primary source uh, documents that we could get, um, uh, and that was another learning curve for me, actually just, just logistically, how do you request it from a, <laughs> a museum? <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is, you know, so, so just such a learning process with everything. And then how long did it take me to do things? Some things took no time at all. Some things were very, just, just like with drawing in general, sometimes things are behaving and I'll, I'll say, you know, my husband will come in and he's like, how is it going? Well, nothing's behaving today, <laughs> you know, because it, it, when you do things analog and, and especially with ink, it just, it works where it doesn't. And sometimes it's just the way your hands are, are doing. So you just have to draw it and draw it and draw it until it works. Um, but uh, actually one, th and, I, and another first for me was spending two full days on one drawing, which I hadn't done before. And this is, this is two times the size um, that it appears in the book. And I spent two days on that, two straight days. And uh, just because I wanted every single detail to be perfect, I usually draw very quickly and draw things over and over because I want that spontaneous feeling. But I'm, I hope I struck a balance of it feeling very, you know, immediate and also very considered. So the answer to that is <laughs> it's all over the place, how long things take. And then um, I took on this book in 2018 and it's published now. So, so it, it took a while for everything. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, you both talk about how much research you did to educate yourselves on this topic and you do such a good job of educating your readers too. So I wanna talk about um, the, you call it back matter these very important short mm -hmm. essays at the end because you bring up such important concepts um, and so matter. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, the language that you're very intentional about using. Um, so like, for example, instead of evacuation, you know, it's forced removal or instead of 
uh, internment camp or relocation center you use um, as a language. So if you could talk a little bit about the language that you chose to use. Yeah, that, that was, of course, very intentional because the, um, the government chose those words that were used up until pretty recently by most people, not everyone, but they, they were lies. I mean, you know, people are evacuated from a flood or from a fire. This was not an evacuation. You know, this was a forced removal. So finding the, you know, right words and being willing to say them and say like, nope, this is actually what it was. For the most part, that was a very smooth process. The one phrase that was problematic for me was the term concentration camp, because literally the incarceration that we did, Americans did of the Japanese, Japanese Americans was to put them into concentration camps. That's what these were. They were not relocation centers. But the problem is, I didn't want to, we've, we've started to use, we have for a long time used concentration camps to equal what was happening in Europe during World War II. And I didn't want to minimize that, but I needed to be able to say what the difference was. So for me, I had to do that in the back matter because it was too complex a thing to toss the word concentration camp around. It, it had to be done with a lot of explaining material, particularly to a younger audience. So um, that was the one place that was a little bit uh, tricky to work out. But I, I, you know, I think it was really, really, really important too. I mean, it's, you know, words do matter. It's like, a, you, you gotta, and I am grateful that today we care what words we use and, and we're all learning to use more appropriate vocabulary all the time because we all are realizing how important the right word is. Yeah, lots of unlearning yeah. on, on <laughs> even even for me, yeah. you know, um, growing up in the 80s, growing up in the 90s, lot, lots of things that were fed to me that I had to unlearn, um, uh, which kind of, if you want to talk about the model minority myth, like that, that aspect of it, I know you had a, yeah, you had a great right. question about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I think that's really important because I think maybe Fewer people have heard that term, the you know, model minority. We say it's the model minority myth. Um, and so you wrote a really great short essay on that, Lauren. So um, can you maybe just describe what that means, model minority, um, and uh, how it's been you know, weaponized or how, how it's used and why it's so harmful, I think, and then maybe even how it's relevant to today? Totally. Um, you know, I... <laughs> I wrote it, so I'm going to just, you know, read it because I think I summed it up pretty well. Uh, the model minority myth is an enduring racial stereotype commonly applied to Asian Americans. It characterizes this diverse group as a monolith of hard work, productivity, and obedience. While these traits could be viewed as positive, they are part of a myth that erases individuals and unfairly lumps all Asian cultures together. And um, it holds the danger of it, and and you know, even something that I've dealt with myself, it, it, it holds Asian Americans, again, that, that term, you know, it's just, it's just such a clump together of so many different types of people. It holds them to an impossible standard. In, so that's one causes that internal trauma, um, uh, that generational trauma. And also it pits other people of color against each other because it says, well, you know, uh, and this article that I dug up from the New York Times from 1966, you know, Japanese are like the best minority or, you know, like this, the, you know, I, I'm not quoting it correctly, but this idea of, oh, they, they, they look at all the stuff they went through and they're productive and, and they contribute to American society. And, um, you know, why can't, why can't black Americans do this? Why can't they? And, and so it, it is, it is a tool of white supremacy to pit people of color against each other. And that is, you know, is happening literally <laughs> yesterday, you know, happening today, happening at this moment. Um, and uh, it's, 
it's very, it can be very subtle and it can be just these little microaggressions. It can be the, the, the language we use about ourselves, e even as Asian Americans, you know, I, I would always say, oh, I'm such a bad Japanese person. I'm such a bad Asian. I'm so bad at math. I'm so bad at this. And it's like, well, why did I have that? in my mind as a thing I had to do. I am a person, I am my own person and I'm good at some things and bad at some things. So it, it, it erases that individuality, which is, it, it can only be harmful and it's a tool to, to cause harm. And that's why it, you know, we just need to unlearn that in our own selves, you know, and unravel that in our own minds, people of color and, and, just, and just stamp it out when you see it, <laughs> when other people try and use it, so. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, so I have many more questions, but we also have some great, fantastic questions from the audience. So we're going to turn to, uh, to one of those now. Um, so this is from Michaela and the question is, well, thank you both for this incredible discussion. So the question is, what other books do you see your book in conversation with? I think it's a good one. That is a great question. And I am really bad at book titles. There is a couple of wonderful other books out this fall. Mm -hmm. Lauren, do you have them at the top of your brain? Um, it, there is one a beautiful picture book about the library. Um, Love in the Library. Is that it Love in the Library? Yep. Yeah. And um, that's Maggie Takuda Hall. And just, again, this very simple love story just, just microwing in on this one beautiful interaction between these two people. Again, humanizing, beautiful, gorgeous. The drawings, ha, huh, you know. So, it, for me, just on so many levels, just so gorgeous. And, um, but Betsy, yeah, what, what do you? Sorry. Yeah, gorgeous. There we I, go. And so, so, yes. and then, yeah, there, there's. A, a lot coming There's out, thankfully, about this subject matter. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. There's a wonderful novel that's just come out, Under Something Sky. What is this? Oh, I feel bad because it's an <laughs> amazing novel. Uh, and I don't remember the title right now. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm like trying to quickly question. look I'll it up because I know exactly the book you're talking about. Under the Broken Sky? Yes. Mariko Nagai? Yes, that's it. That's it. Yeah. I'm a little, I'm a little Googler yeah. um, because yes, I, I, I'm, I, I, all of these beautiful books coming out um, and it's, yes. it's good. It's good that there's so much, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, yeah. it, oh, yeah. oh no. We're, Cause that's, that's another tool of like, there can only be one. There could only be one. Like, yeah. no, there could be millions. Like, so, and we want there to be so many of that, that it's just like a wealth of different perspectives. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it, it's, it gives you that surrounded feeling because a novel can do certain things that a nonfiction book can't do, you know, and a, and a picture book can do other things as well. So you, it's an aggregate of all these beautiful stories, beautiful books. And you already mentioned too, I mean, in your slide, you had the, the photo of Impounded. Is it, is that Linda Gordon? Yes. Is it, and then yes. oh, um, yeah. I also think of Citizen 13660, but I, this is so unique, again, in that you are, you have this narrative, but you have the historical photographs and these just amazing illustrations to weave everything together. So I think this is just such a unique and important book. Um, and yeah, again, such a great question. Um, and we have another question from Kimi. Uh, how did you decide on the order in which the photographs are shown? Another good question. Well, first of all, uh, fortunately for me, they fell into a timeline. Because Dorothea photographed before the incarceration and then the, the time at Tanfran and then the move down to Manzanar. So we had the beginning of the whole incarceration in her work. And then Toyo's work was happening during this whole period of years. And then Ansel came in towards the very end of the incarceration. So that was the general overall timeline. And then after, you know, people tend to think that nonfiction is uh, facts. Well, it is facts, but the, if you can get the emotional through line, that's very real, but if you get it, then you've got a hooked reader. 
you know, then you've got guts in your story. So we chose photographs that had emotional resonance. So they went in this order, like, uh, again, there I was busy sticking in my favorite photos and then Lauren was busy in her turn sticking in her favorite photos. But this is a photograph for me that has always been very, very impactful. This is a Japanese American, I believe. I believe he's Japanese American, not just, not Japanese. Uh, he has cleaned up his farm because in the morning he will be going onto a bus to go to Tanforan. If that isn't the loneliest, saddest photograph ever, I mean, it's just, oh man. So Dorothea got that moment, you know, and she was a brilliant photographer. She really was. So there's a lot of resonance in her photographs. So then I got all my favorites together. And then as Lauren began working, the book starts taking her rhythm as well. So as we mentioned, we ch changed up some of the photographs that worked better for Lauren for what she was doing. And just, oh, I, I found myself mostly adding to, to, to what you were saying or saying like, well, th this, you know, I think, I think I, I uh, think in that same spread, um, we added these, the strawberry farmer with her son in the, in the military outfit. Yeah. And that was just that it was such a beautiful example of the of the dialogue uh, that we had, and um, so so the whole spread, and uh, yeah. and also the way that we wanted to frame it, um, like I I would I definitely wanted to keep impounded in the on the impounded photos with the with the handwriting, um, and then keep some of these negative things and 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 Betsy you know was you know championing that as well because it's so much about like the the actual it gives you it gives you just more texture to what these negatives were like and and the, the handwriting on the on the negatives and so that was another aspect to the photography and we we've tangented this question but um yeah just just as another interesting aspect to it actually that that was lauren's idea to like show the framework i mean i wanted the impounded on there and we actually had to get complicated to get a hold of those but <laughs> yeah. um but because i come from this photography family i'm used to everything being so like you just show the photograph and lauren's like hey let's show these rough edges and i'm like ah, ah, I can do that. but you, we did it and, and it was you know <laughs> So that was Lauren's genius there. Well, I did it's not just, come up with that. It's, it's just that, well, I mean, you championed it. You said, okay, you know, even if you felt yeah. a little uncomfortable right. with it, because because um, it just, just to give, because yes. it, photography is just such a big part of this book. And we didn't, we, we've talked a little bit about this, but just even um, the process of photography and the process of making a photo and the, the contrast to today when it's like, click, you know, great photo in your pocket, a great a camera in your pocket, click. And we wanted to highlight how like complicated it actually was to take two photos <laughs> and how it took hours and hours. So photography was like the-, yeah, the Lauren, point. I'm like, okay, now, yeah. Lauren, okay, here's the deal. Okay, it's gonna be like this and it's gonna be like this. And oh, look, here's a picture. Yeah, here's let me just take a picture of the timer that my dad used in the dark room, and then I love you it. can just go ahead and draw it. <laughs> so, oh, every now and then yeah, I get these gold really nuggets glad. of like, here's here's this thing I just had. I'm like, oh, well, that's ex literally exactly what I needed. So, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Oh, we need some old tin cans of what the developer looked like. Okay, no problem. <laughs> you mean like yeah. this? Yeah. So just your shorthand with that world just made this so rich and so. Ugh, I just. I just loved getting into photography like that because at in high school I like developed my own photos. I loved like being in the dark room, and so it was a real like kind of coming back to that interest for me, for sure. Any other questions? Um, we are we're, yes, we are running short on time. This has been so interesting. Um, I, I guess as like a final question, I'm sort of wondering uh, what takeaway you would want your readers. Um, to have at the end of the book, there could be many, but that's one. I think you Betsy, you go. Yeah. On. <laughs> I, I actually, I, I, 
I want people to think. I just want people to think and reflect so that, you know, we have one little section there about what can you do today? How can you bear witness to history? Please think, reflect, bear witness, be an honest witness to what we're doing. That's my takeaway. Um, yeah, just to piggyback off that, just questioning the, the, the visuals you see, especially as a young person. Um, you know, you can, it's the everyday visuals you see um, on Instagram. Um, it's photos released by ICE being like, well, here's what our detention centers are like. They're very pleasant, <laughs> you know? So, it, which it's so propaganda, <laughs> it exists today. It, it, it's still rampant. Um, so just question it. And, and for me personally, yeah. I, I, um, uh, I started to think about my own identity within within North America, because again, I'm Canadian, but so if any of, it's for everybody, but for Asian American children, <laughs> young adults, um, we can be disconnected from our heritage. And uh, so I, if it was kind of a, a link back there for me. So that's one other takeaway. I did too, I cheated. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and I, I was kind of leading you there. I think those are exactly the points I was hoping you would get at. And you're right. At the end, you mentioned that, you know, social justice is a big theme of the, um, the book, too. And you mentioned that all of us has a tool for social justice in our pockets today. And so one point I just wanted to make is that, you know, there's during World War II, when Japanese Americans were vulnerable, very few people stood up for Japanese Americans, but I really think that Dorothea Lang is a very good example of someone who stood up for Japanese Americans at that time through her photography. Yes. And you know, you could argue Ansel Adams as well, but they were very rare. And I think that's the difference today. You know, um, there's still so many people whose civil rights and civil liberties are, you know, at stake. And um, and I think there are more people who are standing up for those who are vulnerable. So that's a great point that all of us has that responsibility and can do something about it. Um, there's another really great question in the chat that I'm, unfortunately, I don't know if we can get to, but I think uh, if you get the book, the answers are definitely in there. So I just wanted to plug um, Elizabeth and Lauren's book, Seen and Unseen. And just to say that um, this book is available now and you can find it at any, or at the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, but also, you know, we hope that you will get your own personal copy. And so you should look for the book at your local independent bookstore. Um, and uh, so anyway, thank you so much for this just really rich conversation today. I, uh, I learned so much from both of you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you so much for a great conversation. I uh, really appreciate it. It was very meaningful and uh, very thoughtful. Thanks, thank guys. You. Thanks for having us. Thanks for the support. Yes. Thank yeah, you. it's a wonderful yeah. book. Everyone should get three copies. So yes. <laughs> borrow three copies. From your indie bookstores. From your indie. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the library. Right. But number yes. one, the and library. And number two, the borrow library. one from the library and yeah. then purchase two yeah. from an independent bookstore yeah. and give them away as gifts. Yeah. Perfect. That's right. Thank right. you so much. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And thank you so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events for more upcoming LA Maids and your author programs, including our next program on Thursday, November 17th at 4 p.m. for Witnesses for the Dead. Join an all-star lineup of mystery writers, including Gary Phillips, Gar Anthony Harwood, and many others as they'll be talking about their latest anthology, Witnesses for the Dead. Viewers watching the program will have an opportunity to win a free copy of this new book. So until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. The success of LA Made and literally all of our library programs cannot happen without viewers like you. So thank you very much and have a great day.